So uh, I have a long list of collaborators to thank. Uh, and I just cut short our community just by saying SciPy community. There are many people here who have contributed in, in uh, various ways to uh, the work that we've been doing. Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of my laboratory and what we're uh, up to with Proteus. Uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the, the things that we've learned and some of the future directions that we're uh, excited about. Uh, so first of all, uh, so I work at the Coastal and Hydraulics Laboratory at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. And our laboratory was formed uh, in the 20s in response to one of the big Mississippi River floods. And uh, our, our mission is to support the Army Corps of Engineers, both in their civilian mission, which is supporting uh, our nation's waterways, and also in their military mission, uh, support, uh, supporting the warfighter uh, in, in whatever ways that engineering uh, can support them. So things like uh, bridging and airfields and uh, all kinds of things that, that happen on the battlefield. Uh, so for a couple of motivating examples of some of the things that we're doing in Proteus, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about some, some things that are happening, uh, particularly with three-dimensional uh, surface water flows. Uh, so here's an example of the, uh, the Bluestone Dam. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's on the New River, I believe. Uh, it was designed for 430,000 uh, cubic feet per second, uh, and now they'd like to more or, more or less double the capacity of that dam. Uh, and so the, the Corps has been charged with you know, seeing whether it can really handle that. And what my lab has traditionally done is physical modeling. So we build, uh, we have large, very, very large hangars that have large scale models of, of various structures. Uh, and you try to use those to help guide the design. So here on the, uh, on the left is the, one of the scale models of this dam. And then on the right, of course, is a picture of the real dam. Uh, and, and one of the things we're interested in is using this section uh, the section that's closest to you, which was originally built to uh, handle uh, hydroelectric uh, generators, but they were never installed. And so the idea is you could use those to route some additional water through the dam. Uh, and so here's a quick uh, demo of the uh, what's called a sectional model, just w one or two of those parts of that section uh, in, in one of our flumes. And so you can see that that flow is very fast, so it's very high Reynolds number, uh, and it's aerated and very turbulent. Uh, and the worry here is that that is going to cause scour, which will undermine the dam and eventually cause it to fail. Okay, So this is a problem that uh, doesn't really scale all that well, so in, even though we're using a scale model here, uh, you really need to know what's happening at the, uh, at the scale of interest, so computational modeling is a natural a natural tool to try to use. Uh, here's another example that involves a lot of the same features, except it's a coastal example, and we're more interested in waves than, than high Reynolds number uh, flows like you would have in a river. So this is a breakwater that protects a military refueling station in the Azores, uh, and the Corps designed this breakwater. Uh, and on the right, you see it being hit by a, more or less the, the design storm, a 100-year storm. Uh, and that kind of storm throws around very large concrete uh, breakwater structures uh, but, uh, and sort of rearranges it a bit, but in this case it, it actually held. Uh, but we need to understand the, the interaction of waves with these sort of things. And so it's, it's, it's a porous structure on top of being something that's interacting with a difficult three-dimensional flow. Uh, so, so here we have, we have real air effects, we have turbulence, uh, and we also have a, a porous structure that we're interacting with. Uh, similar sort of thing, which I'll just skip over basically, is, is, is in navigation where we care about uh, uh, designing and redesigning and retrofitting navigation structures. Um, and so we have to, uh, again, deal with the same sort of collection of phenomena, a lot of times fully three-dimensional effects uh, near large vessels, uh, but in the context of some larger uh, thing that's a combination of engineered uh, structures, so we've got concrete that we laid, and then we've got natural structure there as well. Uh, so that was, uh, I was very interested in the previous talk because uh, geostatistics plays a role in how we characterize the, the natural portions of our domain as well. 
So, uh, so I'll, I'll discuss a little bit of the why of Proteus uh, before I get to the what. Uh, <clears throat> and I guess I don't have a board here, but uh, so the, the, the reason that we developed it, uh, or one of the reasons, is, is to bridge what we call the valley of death between new advancements in, in model formulations, which you could call physics, numerics, which would be solvers, discretizations, uh, other aspects that are not physics, uh, and production codes and applications. Okay, It's very difficult if you have a good new method to see it incorporated in production code sort of on the lifetime of a grad student or postdoc or something like that. Uh, our production codes are still based on 20-year-old technologies. And that's not just because the government's not good at doing this. Uh, I, was, I was discussing the situation in petroleum reservoir simulation uh, last week. Uh, same sort of thing in, in that community where they, they've got lots of money and lots of commercial uh, research going on, but some of the, gr the best new methods uh, for approximating subsurface systems are still not being used in petroleum reservoir simulation, at least that we, we know of. Uh, so we want this valley of death is sort of, uh, is this gap between good cutting edge algorithms that have been proven in the literature and this uh, production level code, which is often way, way behind. Uh, and the same thing happens with model formulations. Uh, so you'll see in a second, one of the things I've been working on are these model formulations that can handle these type of multi-phase fluid structure interaction problems. Uh, and we're still a long way from getting those used uh, in the engineering community. Uh, so we need something to, to help us bridge that. So to, 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 uh, to start working on solving this, we developed a prototype, uh, which eventually uh, we renamed to Proteus. Uh, and in that prototype, uh, it was designed. Uh, it was designed as a working prototype, so a real code. It's not a prototype as in a toy. It's a prototype as in we knew we weren't trying to just build a new version of our enterprise code right away. Uh, we were trying to build, put as many of the features in it that we uh, could. Uh, and something I, I like to remember is a quote by a famous uh, math, applied mathematician. He said, "Good numerics is ultimately about getting things to work." And the slavish and blind devotion to one approach above all others is usually a sign of unfamiliarity with the range of troubles and challenges presented in real applications. Uh, and so this is somebody, this is from somebody who pioneered some great numerical methods, particularly level set methods. Uh, uh, but I, I think it, it, uh, it's something that's it's not, uh, not very widely understood, I think. And that, that's it's part of the reason why we have this valley of death. Uh, we get people clinging to particular methods and particular formulations uh, and not being open to other ones. Uh, and it's partly, a lot of times, their lack of familiarity with the, what's really going on out there that causes that uh, clinging to a specific technology. So with Proteus, we're trying to include a lot of technologies in the same code so that we can start to be objective about comparing uh, the, the trade-offs uh, in those various methods and formulations. Uh, so what is it? It's a Python package. Uh, it also contains a lot of handwritten and optimized C, C++, and Fortran code. <clears throat> uh, and, and the sort of simple fundamental thing that we try to maintain is the split between physics and numerics. So we're trying to build a representation of the physics uh, that does not uh, hide any numerical analysis type approximations in the physics. And this is so that we can then compare later different numerical methods for the same set of physics. Uh, and then conversely, we can compare the same numerical method across a range of physical models of interest. Uh, and again, try to make these objective decisions about how you move forward with, with new models and methods. It has a layered API, so a very high level API for getting things in there quickly. And then uh, you have to drop down to a lower level in order to um, get optimal performance. Uh, which was part of the design, but it's also part of the design that we're not all that happy with. Uh, and it contains many uh, wrapper, uh, wrapper modules, which is surprisingly hard to convince people to do. So ADH, the Adaptive Hydrology Code, is one of our models, and we wrapped it. Uh, can't really get anybody to use it. Um, and so uh, I, that's another thing I'm not so happy with. I don't know um, how to move forward with that. Uh, it's, it's this harder problem of convincing a community to participate uh, in things that could potentially uh, 
you know, harm them in small ways, right? They might decide that their methods are, are, are no longer really the best and they might have to start looking to some new ones. So here's, a, here's an overview of the framework, and I made this up actually. It, 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 the main thing that it's for is for us to pitch an open source model in the military. And so it tries to, the red here is the, the things that are potentially sensitive. Uh, and our point is that the things that are sensitive are domain specific, application specific things. Uh, if you look down in the lower levels that are green, a lot of the stuff that's really, uh, you know, maybe state of the art research, we have. Uh, linear and nonlinear multigrid uh, that we, we put in there, uh, geometric multigrid that is, that we have uh, higher order finite element methods, uh, various other things, but you know, you can look that stuff up in, in, in applied math journals and you can go out and invent it uh, or, or, or re-implement it yourself. Uh, so those really we can't claim are sensitive and I think we need to be sharing as much as we can. Uh, and so as you move up from that, as you get into more specific uh, aspects of an application is where it gets sensitive. So we're trying, we're working hard to come up with a policy that would allow us to release, uh, at the very least, the more abstract parts of our toolkit. Uh, so I guess I better start to wrap it up. Here's a, here's a, uh, here's a list of the equations solved, which I'll, I'll, I'll just skip over, but if you see one in there that you're interested in and want to talk about it later, please come see me. So lots of surface water type flow equations and also subsurface flow. Uh, so we more or less have to cover the entire hydrologic system. We also have some um, soil mechanics in there as well. Uh, uh, on the numeric side, we were initially tasked with only unstructured methods, so we don't have finite volumes in there, but we're not opposed to looking at finite volumes and structured methods. Uh, we've just mainly put our, our, our effort into unstructured problems. So we have the classical uh, stabilized continuous Galerkin methods, also the locally discontinuous Galerkin me method for hyperbolic problems, and then the uh, primal discontinuous elements as well. Uh, various Riemann solvers and uh, flux limiters and that sort of thing. Uh, we also have a, we're building a pretty good size verification and validation and regression testing uh, frameworks. Uh, I'll, I'll just skip that. Right now we're using BuildBot for regression testing, uh, but we'd be happy to use something else. So um, here, here's sort of the way that we organize our API right now is we focus really on a template of a, of a general nonlinear system of partial differential equations. Uh, most of our models are second order, so we don't have anything that's higher than second order in space. Uh, but in this particular template, each of these coefficients, so M, F, A, phi, R, and H, can be nonlinear. They can depend uh, on your spatial and your temporal variables. So for example, your A variable here might vary on, um, on the material properties if it's, say, a geostatistical property. Uh, and so what the user is trying to do is tell us what coefficients are in this template of, a, of a, an equation and what, how those coefficients depend on the unknown and on space. Uh, so skipping to what that looks like, uh, can, okay, I hope that you can read that. I tried to shrink it onto a single slide. Uh, what we have uh, in the, the initializer, or the constructor, uh, is a set of dictionaries, and those terms that I showed you on the previous slide, M, F, A, phi, R, and H, uh, we give kind of a full name, mass, advection, diffusion, potential, and reaction, and you supply the, those uh, dictionaries corresponding to those, and that tells us what coefficients of the PD are present. It also tells what their dependence is so that we can optimize on that later. So linear, constant, nonlinear, et cetera. And then we use this evaluate function to actually give the explicit physics. So this is an example of a linear advection diffusion equation. So then we load that into our P file, which is a module, and that's where the physics goes. And again, we try to be careful about not putting in numeric, any numerics into this module. Uh, and so for a general time-dependent PDE, we've got a domain, we have a, a time interval, we have Dirichlet, Neumann conditions, uh, initial conditions, those all go into the physics and we try to make them discretization independent. And we have a numerics file. Uh, I've got a bug in my slide here. This was actually the quadratic continuous Galerkin method. So we've, we've specified a, a finite element space, we've specified quadrature uh, and various other things and that completes the description. And so really, uh, I need to wrap it up to get us back on track, but that's the basic, uh, that's the basic setup. Uh, I'll skip over this as a real application to a levy problem that's got uh, plasticity and uh, 3D groundwater flow. 
uh, which we did for a study, and it shows how we uh, do what you might call multiphysics. Of course, you can write your multiphysics as a system of nonlinear PDEs, but you can also split those using a, an approximation called operator splitting. Uh, and, and that's what we did in this particular case. And that just looks then like a list of tuples of physics and numerics. And you specify uh, a splitting uh, method. Uh, in this case, you use a sequential fixed step splitting uh, to do that type of multiphysics problem. Uh, so this one, we were looking at the um, sensitivity of this levy to the presence of a root system at the base of it. So you can see it. Uh, levy fails around the roots like you might expect if you think roots are stronger than soil. So skipping to the end here, uh, some of the things that we, we're not happy with is that our, our use of storage was kind of fast and loose in the early days and we just used dictionaries of NumPy arrays and we really I think need to be using uh, kind of a global pass over all of our models to build more of a buffer, maybe using a record array or something like that so that we can rearrange storage uh, th that would also make it a lot easier for us to, to write a low-level API where we can just pass in, say, a, a couple of double stars to represent different storage classes in, uh, instead of the current approach, which ends up passing in large numbers of NumPy arrays uh, to the low-level routines. Uh, and the, this, uh, like I said, our, our lower level APIs are, are pretty ugly and I tend to try to discourage people from, from using them if they don't have to. So here's some, some ongoing uh, open issues and ongoing work and I probably shouldn't have put names by these because none of these are really quite finalized yet but one of the things I'm excited about is to try to uh, do another iteration of what we're, we're working on in terms of our high-level API and so go from just an API to an actual domain-specific language for the strong formulation of the PDE uh, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get Andy Terrell to work on some of that in the next year uh, as well as some of the lower-level generation of, of additional domain-specific languages such as the unified form language which already exists and has been very useful uh, for other codes like the Phoenix uh, toolkit. Also, we're working on uh, uh, Python distribution. We, Proteus essentially has to use its own distribution right now, so something that really is on the order of Sage or EPD in terms of the number of packages and the difficulty of building. And the reason we do that is because uh, we started all this in a lot of ways before those existed, and we built up our own tools for supporting HPC machines. Uh, and so we've kind of continued with that. Uh, but I would like to move towards something that is a little bit more useful to the community and we hope to get uh, Dag Sfera Seljubat, who have misspelled his name, and Andre Chertik working on that. Uh, we've also been working with the IPython team uh, on our runtime uh, visualization and, and other UI type uh, issues and we hope to see that progressing more in the next year. Uh, we're also going to be working on additional physics and, uh, and some additional numerics, particularly uh, Adaptive, t adaptive meshing uh, or dynamic meshing for time-dependent problems uh, and better support for discontinuous glurkin. So thanks. Sorry I went over time.